The Partially Examined Life relies on your support. To find out how to help in ways that are cheap or even free, please visit partiallyexaminedlife.com slash support. You're listening to the Partially Examined Life podcast, and this is our special pandemic episode 241, where we'll be giving our thoughts about philosophical issues involved in our current global crisis and local situations. More information and links to some articles by contemporary philosophers on this topic are available at partiallyexaminedlife.com. This is Mark Lentemeyer, locked down in Madison, Wisconsin. This is Seth Paskin, socially distancing in Austin, Texas. This is Wes Alwyn, hoarding loungewear in Cambridge, Massachusetts. This is Dylan Casey, doing Zoom even more than I did before. <laughs> Got many requests to do an episode like this, so we're doing it, I'm saying, pretty much pop style, in that some of us found some articles, we have a shared notes document, we have some outline things, at least that I had suggested, but nobody was required to read anything else that anybody else read, and we can kind of structure this as we see fit. I have a question, or I have a comment that I would like to start off with about flattening the curve. The response to this virus, we're talking about social distancing as a response to try to slow down the spread of the virus, flatten the curve, and all of it seems to be related, notwithstanding that there will be people who die from contracting the virus, but a lot of it seems to be indexed to the hospital capacity and the amount of equipment available in ERs, you know, the appropriate equipment, ventilators and what have you, that assuming an infinite amount of hospital beds and ventilators and well-protected hospital employees, does the command to social distance have the same weight? So in other words, are we taking this action because we're trying to alleviate pressure on the healthcare system? So in other words, even if it were the case that 200,000 people would die if we didn't do this, if our hospitals could handle the burden, would we be doing it anyway? Is that the given the economic costs, the economic and other costs. Yes, that's it, Wes. I think there are two things that happen with the flattening the curve. You decrease the intensity, so you decrease the number of people who are sick at the same time. But you also increase the amount of time that's a social problem. When you see those curves, you see them that they're narrow and tall, so the number of people that are infected is very high, but the amount of time that it's in the population is lower, mainly because it gets through the population and infects all the people that it's going to infect faster. What I don't know when I've seen those numbers is, of course, there's also the total number of people that die from it. So I don't know how it balances out. If the integral is the same, that is the area under the curve, then the same number of people are going to get it regardless. All you do is just change the intensity. And that would mean that, you know, given an infinite response, then the same number of people die. The only reason people die is because they fail in spite of the best support. So in that case, which I think is a pretty idealistic case right now, what you're doing is you are addressing the resources we have to actually maintain the death rate as low as it can be, not have people die simply because they don't have care. There's been some discussion of the economic costs of doing what we've been doing and how you take those into account, right? So you might say, well, You can't put a number on a life, and so whatever economic damage is going to happen, that's what we need to sustain in order to save as many lives as possible. And then you might have other economists coming back and saying, well, not having jobs destroys lives and actually makes people unhealthier and gives them less access to healthcare and more prone to stress, has health health implications or suicide. So you basically, I'm I'm only bringing that up because we're kind of put into the position of trying to engage in a utilitarian calculus, which I think is, it's not impossible. I think policymakers have to look at these sorts of trade-offs, but I think a lot of what people might call an ethical dilemma in this circumstance is just a function of our lack of knowledge. If we knew more, we'd be able to navigate those sorts of questions more easily. So for instance, what are the long-term effects of turning off the economy? And we, we can guess, we can even give very educated and assessments of that, but we don't really know. I think that you're making a good point about the fact that there are so many unknowns that it makes the calculus going on much harder. And I don't mean to even just say it's utilitarian calculus. You know, it's even when it's just sort of pragmatic. 
you know, an example like, well, maybe we'll just say that every life, you can't put a price on a life, but in both real and pragmatic ways, that's just not true. I mean, we do it all the time, right? We tolerate deaths for all kinds of things. Yeah, we have finite resources, which implies necessarily that we put a price, but go ahead. That's true. I would put that kind of utilitarian calculus, right? But it's also just in a pragmatic way. We tolerate all kinds of danger and deaths associated with with modern society and just living in general, involving both chance and bad luck and people's choices. And so in general, I think, going to the point about knowledge and, and how to weigh the different consequences is that we're more comfortable with a lot of them. Like, you know, cars, right? We're more comfortable with the calculus involving car safety and the compromises that we make when we get into a car and when we drive around and the relative risk we have with respect to other drivers, both random and the extent to which we can protect ourselves by being competent and by being aware and the extent to which we're just, you know, taking a risk because, you know, someone could just drive through a stop sign and be drunk and kill us. But we're comfortable with those risks, both the level of those risks and our knowledge of those risks. But in this situation, I think that just like Wes said, we don't know that much about the long-term effects of stopping the economy. We don't know really well what the, you know, the actual death rate is, all the factors that go into actually coming up with a kind of pragmatic weighing of it. It makes it just very hard. And then as time goes on, we, we get to know a lot more. And so the calculus changes. So I was just, I've been reading about now how the ventilator problem seems to be less pressing, I think probably in part because of social distancing. But now, you know, just looking at the New York Times, it seems like doctors have found a better way to treat people. And ventilators, you know, once you ventilated someone, they're more likely to die than not at that point. And ventilators have their own problems. So they've discovered, like, for instance, putting people prone on their side and having them breathe oxygen, but basically changing their body position. The thing that had been prompting them to, to use ventilators was looking at ox- blood oxygen levels usually would incapacitate people, and in this case, for some reason, hadn't. And so that's an example of this being new and learning things that will inevitably change the calculus as we go along. But I guess it makes sense to do what we've done, which is to, if it's an over-response, then that's, well, we don't know exactly what's better, but you got to start somewhere. So, <laughs> and then you refine as you go along. I mean, to address Seth's initial question, I think isn't the goal, at least the way I've been thinking about this, is that, no, we're actually trying to stop the spread. So it's just not the case that we've just, we are fine with 2% of the population dying. You know, And flattening the curve would have made it more than that because we would have had these equipment problems. But that we're not just trying to flatten the curve, we're trying to actually make the integral lower. Is that unrealistic? In the long term, the spread I don't think will be stopped. It'll reach a point of herd immunity at some point. We're just slowing down the rate at which it does that. That's a fundamental question to Mark's point, right? Is the integral the same? It really depends upon whether or not you can get pockets of non-transmission as a result of social distancing, right? If you thin out the number of people altogether that get exposed and therefore totally decrease the, the total amount of infection and therefore the total amount of death, or is it just that you just make it slower and you're just the same number of people are going to die either way? Which essentially makes the most vulnerable people, you know, I, my father is 80 eight and seems to sound like, yeah, I'm never going to get to come and visit you guys anymore. I'm never going to get to get on a plane. You're not going to be able to come here. That if we're just saying we're flattening the curve, but the same people that get it, you know, are still going to be at the same risk and everybody's going to get it eventually, then people in his situation just will never be able to get out of isolation at all. Well, we're waiting on a vaccine. We're waiting on a lot of sure things that are going to improve the situation, vaccines, treatments, Things that I think are actually going to probably going to come quicker than we anticipate. Well, it's also not true. I mean, your conclusion, Mark, is like any virus, right? Eventually, it'll peter out. Then that has to do with herd immunity and has to do with there aren't any more hosts. I mean, viruses live on hosts, right? And eventually, those hosts will go away. And it's not like people remain contagious with a virus after they've survived it and have the antibodies. They're just immune to it coming back to them. It won't be true that the whole world is still infectious to somebody after a certain point. Yeah. The original intent of my question was to ask, are we responding to 
the deadliness of the disease, the social responsibility to other people, or the limitations of the healthcare system, or some combination thereof. And I wanted to kind of drive at that because if you know, we think of an analogous situation where, let's say, there's wildfires. And they say, you guys need to conserve water because we need the water to fight the wildfires. Or please don't travel to this place and don't buy these certain products because we need them to take care of the people in the other, you know, in the other region who are suffering from wildfires. And what are we responding to? And the notion to say that is social distancing, are you morally wrong if you don't social distance? On the face of it, we seem to be saying something like, yes, because you're indirectly risking somebody else's life. That's the idea, that you're being irresponsible. And in reality, what we're talking about here is any number of situations can arise where there is a threatened subpart of the population. The ask is for some privation on your part in order to alleviate or potentially avoid a more serious tragedy for this subpopulation. And I'm wondering if that's what's happening here, not to say it's right or wrong, but then it becomes kind of a moving target based on our ability to manage the exposure of those various subpopulations. If somebody who lives in a part of the country is at risk for some kind of natural disaster, and we are asked as citizens of that same country to accept certain privations, whether it's not purchasing things or not going places, or maybe it's a taxation issue, in order to be able to help those other people out in the case of a natural disaster. This is not a similar situation. You're giving an example. A whole community of people, 20,000 people, live in a hurricane zone. And we know that they have a likelihood of 5% every year of having their community obliterated. Just I mean, it's probably not that high, but let's just say that is maybe a better one would be living in a flood zone. And we fund FEMA in order to bail them out from what they know is a risky situation to their homes or the wildfires in California. You're framing it as a question of, isn't the community being asked to support people for making bad decisions? No. I'm saying, is the community being asked to support a minority based on geographical, economic, whatever limitations. So so let's remove their culpability at all. Just say that they happen to have a different circumstance. Bad luck. Does it matter that, at least even if you're taking out the culpability issue, that it at least seems predictable? If it were really just straightforwardly, only people that have had prior respiratory issues or beyond a certain age need worry about this, which I think is still how it's being thought of in a lot of places, but I guess the New York governor or mayor or somebody was pointing at, you know, over 50% of the cases in New York City right now were people under 50. And again, it still could be the case that older people, respiratory problems, you know, that they're identifiable high-risk populations. And it could just be that because of that, then people who didn't fall into that were ignoring the guidelines or something. But I think then, you know, seeing the response like that, no, no, you know, there's a chance that you, whatever your age, whatever your condition, really could die from this, then that seems to change it completely from, oh, it's just people over there living in the floodlands to it could be me. This makes me think of the first article that was in the list from Bloomberg, which sort of went through the different political philosophy, points of view, the Rawlsian, utilitarian, libertarian, communitarian points of view regarding the relationship of individual obligation to the community and what kinds of relationship, what how that relationship works, noting essentially that the differences between those political philosophies amount to a different balance of responsibilities between individuals and communities. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's called How Kind of Virus is Shaking Up the Moral Universe by John Authors. And I didn't know exactly it was shaking up the moral universe, but mainly it was sort of a survey of how you would think about the response based upon different political philosophies. And it sounded to me like you were articulating a version of the Rawlsian one, right? What would I do if not knowing anything about my individual particular circumstance, what kind of obligations should I have to my fellow human being? If I had no idea 
whether or not my, you know, so my individual risk level for getting coronavirus, stuff like that. That that way of thinking, mm. the kind of Rawlsian way of thinking, would be how we would work through the answer to Seth's question about what our individual obligations are regarding things like social distancing, what kinds of privations should we expect of ourselves and should we expect of other people for the good of the individuals as well as the good of the community. You know, the lens through which we do that balancing. Yes, but it does just seem very different having you know an imagined veil of ignorance versus an actual <laughs> ignorance. And there's that amount of ambiguity that we think both Yes, there are these high-risk groups. I'm not in one of the high-risk groups, but yet, maybe I am. Maybe, I, you know, there could be things that we are not aware of that make me have a greater risk than would be obvious from my demographics. Yeah, that's an interesting point about the veil of ignorance, right? It's a ignorance about the facts of the matter in the sense of where you landed, say, in the social spectrum, but not a veil of ignorance about what the impact of that would be on your life. Whereas you're pointing out that there's another level of ignorance that makes it challenging to weigh the choice you would make under that veil. Yeah, which maybe just points to something that's difficult about applying philosophical thought cases to real situations, is that real life is never as clean. You can't specify the amount of information that you have in the way that you can in a thought experiment. So everybody's trying to engage in these utilitarian calculations. But as Wes was saying earlier, there's so many unknowns that like the spectrum of opinions is not like, oh, I'm more libertarian, I'm more pro-business, and I'm more pro the lives of the vulnerable. <laughs> it <laughs> becomes a matter of a lens through which you interpret the data, perhaps. In other words, it's not like there are two groups that are seeing the same data and making different assumptions. No, they're seeing an unknown and coming up with some sort of estimation, which, of course, will be influenced by sort of what you desire the day to be, what, how much you care about the accuracy. Or. I think this is revealing because we have to make decisions all the time, right, with limited knowledge. And in light of that, so one of the questions is, how long do we keep doing this? When do we start loosening up? And one of the ways to answer that question, and, and it's an important one, is just to look at the mathematical models and see you know, anticipate what will happen if we stop quarantining too soon and cases spike back up. But there's also a realistic limit to what people are willing to tolerate. So it's actually, I was, I was looking at the history of the Spanish flu, and it's remarkable how similar it is down to people running around wearing masks all the time and being told to socially distance and all that stuff. And people are very cooperative, and I think they've been pretty cooperative this time as well. But that cooperativeness had a time limit, and it will have a time limit in this case as well. And what's interesting about that is that part of the answer to the question of how long we do this is how long will people put up with it? You know, on the one hand, it's how many people are going to die if we don't. And then on another, it's how much secondary damage to the economy or to other things is going to happen. But a real pragmatic consideration is how long are people actually willing to do it? Isn't that also correlated with other factors that they're in? Like I was just heard today about, you know, the effect in India that there were manual labor class folks were basically rioting because they weren't being allowed to move around. And it was after a much shorter period of time of the kind of social distancing requirement kind of thing. It made me think, well, with what you were saying was, well, it depends on, you know, how much you know flexibility you have, right? How long can you take, not just from sort of a psychological perspective, but just sort of from a, where's my breaking point in terms of my resources? And what is the social safety net in a country when people are put out of work? If it means people starving pretty quickly, then yeah, it's, that's a lot different than, than other forms of privation that might be caused by the same thing. I feel like in the face of uncertain calculations, right, in, in the face of so many unknowns that we're trying to make calculations based on people do default to what they see as certain principles. So that my intuition is to go with the Butler grievable lives. You know, every life is sort of, okay, well, we don't know how long it's necessary. So let's just do everything that's in our power and make it last as long as it needs to. And, you know, because I don't know how many people are going to die because the economy barrels out. I don't understand the economy well enough. So I'm willing to just go to the limit of what is recommended by the medical community, 
Whereas a diehard libertarian will say, well, what I know for sure is that government forcing people to stay indoors is just plain wrong. So I don't understand the rest of this, but I'm going to go out and take my chances and I'm going to, you know, urge people to potentially sacrifice themselves for the good of the economy or, you know, whatever the horrible right wing talking point is of the day. Part of what happens there is that how long we can continue. So for instance, people rioting is a form of information and people's reactions to quarantine is a kind of information that's useful to that decision making. And so you start out being as strong as possible and asking people to make those sacrifices. And then you observe the level of pressure it creates and the secondary impacts and take those into account. Because a lot of this isn't measurable in a usual way. Paying attention to people's level of dissatisfaction actually becomes, uh, it's telling. You know, if people were out right now rioting everywhere, that would tell you something about the relative costs of the decision. Yeah, that's an interesting point, Wes. Those relative costs are mediated to some extent, depending on what community you live in. So right now in this middle-class suburb that I live in in Austin, we're all waving to each other from either sides of the street while we walk our dogs and, you know, hey, can I get you anything? And we're banding together and whoever makes the Costco run offers to pick things up and whatever. And, you know, people have Instacart and there's all these different mechanisms by which we can mitigate, if you will, money helps us to mitigate, location helps us to mitigate, you know, geography helps us to mitigate the cost of being quarantined. But if instead of living in a house that I could leave and walk my dogs and my with my child and have a pool in the backyard and have the local grocery store deliver to my door and know that it's not going to get stolen or be up 17 flights of stairs, like I think about the people who are in apartments in a densely populated apartment complex somewhere in an urban center who are quarantined, I don't know how they're getting food or when they're going out, how they're managing. But their experience and the cost to them of quarantine is significantly higher than it is for me. I can't make that right. I can't, you know, I can't make that fair, but I understand that they say, okay, everybody in the United States stays six feet away from every other person and as much as it's possible. I almost want to say it's completely meaningless. It's almost nonsensical to give that kind of a directive to somebody who lives in an urban center versus somebody who lives in a rural. These absolute prescriptions for what we're supposed to do, I do much better with practical advice like wash your hands and don't touch your face. Okay. I guess I'm wondering a little bit why something like, well, generally stay, try to stay six feet away from people isn't also practical advice. I mean, it's a behavioral thing, right? Try to guide your behavior so you do... X, because it'll reduce the likelihood of you getting infected. It doesn't sound to me like it's any different than sneeze into your elbow. No, no, I understand what you're saying. I think what I'm saying is that if you give somebody practical advice that they can't in practice implement, it's not as helpful. How's that sound? That's maybe what I meant to say. So if you're in an area where other people are not obeying that, or you just by necessity, you need to go into stores and stores are not themselves enforcing it or the customers in the store are not enforcing it. What if you live on the 12th floor of a building and you have to get in an elevator or go down a narrow stairwell? To It's a very different world for those people than it is for me. That's kind of the point I'm trying to make. So their costs are different than mine. I can bear this much longer. And so I don't want to judge those people if the cost of dealing with this is not something that it's you say, okay, well, it's going to be three months for everybody, or it's going to be until we hit a certain percentage of infection for somebody. People's privation differs depending on their circumstances, and I can't judge or condemn people for hitting the limit, whatever that limit is, if their circumstances are so much different. So you see these people in prison. I don't want to necessarily go deep into this route, but they're in crowded circumstances. They don't have the ability to social distance and they're being deprived of any contact from the one thing that from loved ones, which I'm sure is an extremely meaningful part of their daily routine. They have no control over their environment, no access to. Would you be surprised that those people would find that the privation hits the limit of what they find acceptable quicker than, say, Seth? No, you would not be surprised. 
And my gut reaction to when you say these things is, I've also been thinking about, you know, kind of as a corollary to what I was was just saying about looking for matters of principle when they don't have the full information, is that everybody seems to think their the political viewpoints they already held are being confirmed by this. And so in particular, you know, if I'm listening to Chapel Trap House or whatever, then yeah, we should have a robust social safety net so that people you know, are guaranteed minimum income and things like that. People are having these problems all the time. It's just that it's only because so many of them are having them at the same time that it actually puts a light on it and makes us think, oh, we, I guess we should do something in response to this. But there are plenty of people that are homeless or facing similar privations on a daily basis outside of these circumstances. So why don't we have things in place that would have prevented this kind of thing from being exacerbated now? So that's kind of what I'm tempted to say. However, I've also seen on the other side, and I was just listening to an econ talk with Tyler Cowen. Tyler Cowen is this economist we've talked a little about before in the Elizabeth Anderson episode. He gives a straight up utilitarian defense of free market capitalism that, you know, the more we allow completely free market capitalism to go forward, then we see a growth in the overall standard of living from generation to generation that just dwarfs anything else that you could want. So you might want to lessen people's pain by having a guaranteed minimum income or a minimum wage or welfare or anything else. But if that is stopping even an iota, the giant economic machine of growing, 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 then in the long run, you're doing more harm than good. This is a guy that in this Econ Talk episode responded to this by saying, when we hit situations like this, people retreat and get very selfish, get very, you know, just me and my people. And, you know, the kind of Bernard Sanders leftism that's out there, that is really just a toy, a plaything of the satisfied, you know, the people that are rich enough to feel generous to everybody else. And so he predicted that kind of left-wing politics will simply go away in the face of this. So it's so hilarious that, you know. <laughs> did you just call him Bernard Sanders? Yes, he did. <laughs> that's what they call him on Chapel Trap House. So you can have to tell that's, that's what hilarious. I've been listening to. Both sides are giving opposite political predictions based on what they already believe. Well, I'm actually surprised by the amount of consensus and coordination. And I'm less, I think, pessimistic and critical of the way things have gone than most people. Because I think if I were to write a movie about this, not knowing what I know now, and to guess what the effects of this sort of thing would be, if I were being catastrophic, I would say, yeah, people are going to riot and be uncooperative at the very least, or just, uh, they're definitely going to try to take more than their share of toilet paper, which of course they, they did. But <laughs> but in general, despite the toilet paper, I think it's revealed a surprisingly high level of willingness to sacrifice and cooperate socially. And I wonder if it will narrow the distance politically in some ways, I'm wondering what the, what the aftermath will be. Mm. Let's stop for a sponsor break. With more than a billion people quarantined worldwide, public events canceled, and people out of work, we're all looking for ways to stay calm and manage anxiety, particularly about COVID-19 viruses, our health, and our livelihoods, which makes it a perfect time to check out The Great Courses Plus content on meditation, yoga, and hobbies. In The Science of Mindfulness, a research-based path to well-being, Ronald Siegel of Harvard offers practical guidance and research on how mindfulness can radically transform your brain and life. Relevant to quarantining, check out Lecture 10, Solitude, an Antidote to Loneliness, where he explains how the ability to be alone is an essential component to intimacy with others and a connection to the world. You may come out of COVID-19 quarantine better able to communicate with others and build healthier interpersonal relationships. The Great Courses Plus is giving PL listeners a free trial, and it's only 10 bucks a month when you sign up for a quarterly plan. Sign up today using our special URL, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash P-E-L. That's P-E-L for Partially Examined Life. Remember, thegreatcoursesplus.com slash P-E-L. Back to the discussion. I don't think it will narrow the political distance, but I do think this is a validation to me of everything that I've thought about. You know, when we talk about the state of nature and it's the war of all against all and, you know, you see The Walking Dead and all this thing, you know, they, all these shows, the post-apocalyptic shows always characterize everything as like, okay, if we get to a place where resources are not an issue anymore 
or you know, a population density is an issue. The worst in people is going to come out. It's like Game of Thrones time or something. And I, I've always thought, well, no, there's an alternative thesis that people will actually come together and collaborate and join together to try and strengthen themselves. And you know, the behavior I'm seeing suggests that my view of things is more accurate than the apocalyptic warfare, you know, fight zone kind of <laughs> kind of picture that we see. I don't think that will bring people together politically. I do think it will change the way we approach certain kinds of decisions about policy related to things like healthcare. And we're going to have to think about it. as people look at the environmental impact of putting the world on pause for a bit and you see how the world, you know, how nature is responding and how the earth is responding. It'll be like a certain kind of awareness. But I also think everybody's going to forget about that quickly and we're going to go right back to. Yeah, where we were before. I just think there'll be some very rich capitalist people who try to kick off some new initiatives and they, maybe there'll be some new policy decisions. I think for me, what I've seen is, I hate to say this because it makes me feel like I'm taking a sharp right turn from my ex- entire existence, but just the absolute failure of governmental bodies, at least in the United States, at every level. And I don't mean failure just like, in the sense of they all fucked up because that's not certainly not the case. But just the governmental structure that has municipalities and states and the federal government and everybody making different decisions and there's no clear area of responsibility, just the complete failure to act with any kind of coherence in response to this. And I know that America is really good at waging war. That's one thing we seem to get together and to be able to do really well. And if we were really, this was really a war on drugs or a war on this virus, maybe we'd be doing a better job of it. But I have to question the notion of a commitment to a governing structure that just was so abjectly unprepared to deal with anything like this and responded in the way we're structured that way. See, I have a much more positive view of our response, despite all its flaws. Yeah, I'm more positive about it as well. Yeah, there are a lot of realistic criticisms. So, for instance, that we should have socially distanced sooner. We should have had a a stockpile of ventilators, for instance. Although, interestingly enough, America has been working on developing that stockpile for 10 years. There's a long article on this in the New York Times and, and how that got messed up. And they're, in fact, due for another big delivery in the middle of this year. But what I'm trying to point out is that Some of these failings are pretty predictable, right? Because the president has to make a big decision to shut down the economy, something that is highly politically beneficial to him. And, you know, there are a lot of incentives not to act quickly enough. So I'm gratified that it was acted on as quickly as it was. And I also, looking at this very, very closely, I was looking very closely from very early on when it was happening in China, and I was kind of in a state of confusion about, well, why is everyone not acting like this is definitely going to happen here, right? They're welding people into their homes and we're acting like this isn't an existential threat. But then I thought, well, other people must know more than me. And so I'm going to wait until they say to panic and then I'll panic. There are people like Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burks. They're they're competent people in the government who are able to say, yes, you have to do this enormously costly thing. And then There are people even, you know, even someone like Trump was willing to say, yes, okay, let's do that. And there's been a huge mobilization to develop a vaccine and treatments and all sorts of things. So I I agree with you, Seth. Like it's in a really dysfunctional, large federal system with people doing their own things at the state and local level. And so there's a lot that can be legitimately criticized. But in general, it's surprising to me how cooperative people have been, how well it's worked, how quickly we've gotten past the peak of this on April 11th, I guess, or April 10th. And I think, you know, if you look at the amount of people who would have died if it were left unopposed as to to the 60,000 people, it looks like are going to die by the time this is fully flattened. I think, you know, you could say, okay, that's a measurable and a big, you know, a matter of hundreds of thousands of lives that were saved. Despite all the criticisms, as far as the way the government is structured, I don't see that as necessarily a fundamental weakness in all this, or hasn't been demonstrated to me yet. That's fair. I think the conflicting directives that we got at different levels of the government, the fact that different states were doing different things, points to 
if you're talking about dealing with an existential threat which does not respect national borders or even local borders or state borders, right now we functionally as a society are the way the U.S. government works, uh, the way that government works in the United States, not just federal but also state government, we're not well prepared to respond to this type of existential threat in a climate where it's so politically laden. That's to me where I saw the failure is it's just – I don't know who to believe. There are many people I do not trust whatsoever. There are many people I can't even stand to hear their voice, uh, much less, you know, accept information from them. And how do you know what a credible source of information is and what you should do, right? I mean, it's become established that the guidance to, that you didn't have to worry about wearing a mask in public was intended to prevent a run on mask buying so that there wouldn't be a depletion of supplies for, that were critically needed in you know, they didn't want people out in the middle of the United States who were not at risk to buy N95 masks. That was true for the very beginning that that justification was brought in. I understand that. But my point is, you don't tell somebody, you're not at risk, don't worry about wearing a mask, because you're trying to prevent a run on masks. That points to a fundamental flaw in the system. That unfortunately started with the World Health Organization. And yeah, that's an example of a grievous error. I keep thinking like, While this was all happening, I don't know about you guys, I think most well-intentioned Americans were like, okay, give me some information, help me understand what's happening and what needs to be done. We started this conversation talking about what should I suffer, what should I put in privation. If we understand what the impact of our actions are, if we understand what the significance and what the situation is, it was very hard to get good information and for us to understand what the impacts of all these things were. I agree as to a certain point with you, Seth, but I found that that aspect of it was much more, frankly, at the federal level. And there were voices in the federal level that were, you know, trying to have a relatively clear eyed view, speaking about as much as possible about facts, being sort of clear headed about what we don't know, and acknowledging things that we're making decisions in a context of what we don't know. But I saw many states really trying to organize as best they can and doing a pretty good job of getting information that they could get together, coming up with pragmatic action plans regarding the information that they have and getting their information as best from multiple sources. California did this, Oregon did this, and even New York, New York, even though they're like, you know, at the epicenter now, they're all doing that. And I think, if anything, what I've seen is I've seen you know, sort of the aspect of our country of being a union of states and communities to there's some variation in their individual ability to and willingness to sort of engage. But that's what you see. You see that kind of variation. And unfortunately, I think you also see that there was a long-running unwillingness on the federal government side to have act as coordinator-in-chief on it. As far as I'm concerned, they've just been basically bulldozed by the states in terms of any demonstration of effectiveness. They're the ones who are actually acting. The, the exception is you know, economic legislation that's gone on because the federal government is way more well-positioned to provide significant monetary economic relief. So is this an argument in favor of Montesquieu's separation of powers? Or it sounded like Seth was starting by saying, wow, we thought separation of powers was a good idea, but it just shows that you need actual coordination for something like this. So screw separation of powers. Whereas Dylan is saying, yeah, but if it was all under one roof, then it would all suck. We need the separation of powers. So at least the response some places, at least in some of the states, it can be good. I think it's an argument for separation of powers in the sense that both in terms of a separation of powers in a Montesquieu way between regions of the government, but it's really more of a federal argument of separation of powers. That, yeah, this is more like a Tocqueville thing, a separation of powers in the sense of at different levels, at the federal, state, and local levels, yeah. So it adds resiliency. Now, what you do give up is you do give up the sheer force of authoritarianism to act very, very quickly. And I'll grant that, but I'll trade what we have right now for that reaction in a heartbeat. And I think there's very limited aspects of it. And I think as we cultivate a community that values a a more balanced 
arrangement between individuals and communities where the individuals are expected to have some understanding about what's going on and being able to parse out varieties of sources of information and come to some of their own decisions, along with there being, you know, sort of this, uh, I don't know, economy isn't quite the right word, but um, multitudes of voices. And I, I thought there was a pretty, it was dynamic and changing, but people trying to make decisions based upon decent information and then revising it along the way as we learn more stuff. And some of it was like what you said, that there were, you know, maybe some questionable kinds of lack of facts. But overall, I've been heartened to see how vibrant our individual communities are in being willing, in interacting with this, engaging with it. Well, my grocery stores and my restaurants, the fact that people are trying, you know, individual people are worried about other people losing their jobs and other businesses going out of businesses. So they're trying to make a point of going and helping those businesses a little bit. I think it, it shows us in a pretty good light overall as a community. The, the criticism I have is just our unwillingness to be as prepared for this as we could have been because It's been years and years and years that it's been a pandemic is going to happen. It's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And the fact that we, you know, took so long and are still not as good at the testing as many, many other places, and that would have made a material difference. The fact that we weren't even thinking about it in that way and that we didn't have a rolled out, let's roll out the carpet about, you know, how do we respond to this? Well, we start activate this response regarding the CDC, I mean, activate this response regarding getting testing. The things that have been done aren't rocket science in terms of understanding how to manage pandemics. It's just that we weren't prepared to do it on a scale that was anywhere close to what we are now. The fact that we have responded so quickly is heartening to me overall, but we could have been way, way, way better prepared. Well, do you guys agree with the, I immediately diffused my point about guaranteed minimum income and things by saying, oh, but, you know, people who are conservative see their beliefs. How do you guys feel? Like, because I really do strongly believe, yes, we should have already had a guaranteed minimum income and this shows it. And we should have already had national health care and this just demonstrates it. Yeah, I mean, I think I agree with that. Like a guaranteed minimum income appeals to me. I don't know enough to evaluate the costs of it or the, you know, if there's if there's negatives to it, but I, I've always liked the idea. And then Universal healthcare, I think that's demonstrated that that works in other countries, and it's ethically ethically it's what I think is required. And, and yeah, those two things would have, would have made an enormous difference. Whatever the case, there should be a strong enough social safety net that we can weather the consequences of something like this without people's lives being destroyed, which will itself have lots of for people who think about the economy, lots lots of negative long term negative economic impacts. And so they should, you know, for people who are worried primarily about the economy, they should take that into account. If they're not compelled by it ethically, they should take into account the fact that a social safety net provides other forms of security and as well socially. When I picture social safety net, I picture it purely at the level of individuals. In other words, I don't put a lot of stock in businesses should have a, a safety net because businesses are important and businesses are ultimately the way that income normally gets distributed. And so I'm sort of satisfied. Like if we have a minimum guaranteed minimum income, I don't really care about, you know, this is just out of my economic ignorance, I think in part, but, you know, ongoing loans to businesses to make sure that they keep being able to, you know, so I guess I'm willing to let things fail as long as there actually is the the safety net for individuals. But maybe that's just a uh, prejudice of an individualist prejudice against corporatism. I understand because we're living very vividly through that as my wife had to furlough 150 employees. She's hardly a corporation and these loans are very real things for businesses like hers. They were a fully vibrant, viable concern and through no fault of their own, much like a natural disaster, you know, a hurricane or a tornado, whatever. There's no such thing as insurance for a worldwide pandemic shutdown. Like there was no way to insure themselves against any kind of thing like that. So are you just going to let 80% of the or 90% of the businesses that employ 60% of the people in the United States to just disappear overnight because of this thing that they can't control? That seems patently unfair, but it seems more unfair in the context of 
these businesses employ people, and that's what's important, right? There are reasons why you want to prop up Delta and American and United and all that kind of stuff, and part of it is the people they employ, yes, and part of it is the role that they serve in the functioning of the economy. But as long as we live in a world where businesses are responsible for providing health care, essentially, that's the model we have. Businesses are responsible for providing health care and wages, which make it possible for people to function and ultimately prosper or not in the society. So all the arguments I've heard in favor of universal basic income have been pretty compelling. I don't know enough about the details of the, the numbers and the economics. And I'm certainly sure that our healthcare system is in many ways broken. The fact we talked about this with Sandel, about it being a market system where maybe it shouldn't be. But, you know, I want to talk just a second to what Dylan said about the communities coming together versus my criticism of the governmental response has to do with the dissemination of information and the decision-making process. Like, who's in charge and what information are they acting on and what are they telling us to do, right? And where that varies from place to place and whatever. I have no dispute with the way the communities have come together. I mean, I, I feel as connected to my local community now as I ever have. And I've met more people in my fucking neighborhood in the last three weeks than I'd ever seen before. You know, I mean, people are coming out of their houses and they, but I also see in Texas, at least, liquor stores and gun stores are considered essential businesses, right? And this is certainly the kind of event that if we're, one were so inclined might drive one to consume more than the regular amount of alcohol that they normally do. And to guard that alcohol with a gun. <laughs> and to guard that alcohol with a gun. <laughs> And I went to the liquor store and I could see how stressed out those workers were. There are people who have been designated as essential. And because they don't have the information, because they don't know, am I going to get infected? If I get infected, am I going to die? I'm healthy. I think I'm healthy. All I'm doing is selling fucking wine and, and St. Germain and gin and vodka. And I might get sick and die because of it. And all I could do was thank them. I just was like, you know, thank you so much for being willing to do this the model that we have is they could say to their employer, I'm not comfortable working. And their employer could say, okay, well, don't work. And then they're out of a job, right? Now, it's up to the individual employers. There are many employers that say, if you're willing to work, great. If you're not, I totally understand. We're not going to hold that against you. You know, We can furlough you and you can apply for unemployment. Well, then everybody's going to do that, right? Because they're like, well, shit, I'd rather get the same money I'm making now and not have to work and not be have my life at risk. It's just the whole thing is structured in such a way that there are people who are essentially, by virtue of the economic system, being forced to take risks that other people do not have to take. And so, yes, it's great that all the people in your grocery store are coming together and all that, but it's just dumb luck that he happened to be working at that grocery store and be designated as an essential service as opposed to you know, being a massage therapist and being furloughed. And that kind of thing strikes me as something that none of the things that we've talked about and none of the things that we're doing are actually fundamentally addressing. And it's much, 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 much worse for the healthcare workers who are running out of equipment, who are getting sick and dying. I mean, we this could put, have irrevocable or long-term effects on the healthcare system just because so many healthcare workers are going to get sick, so many are going to die, doctors, nurses, med techs, all those kinds of people. It's going to have a devastating effect on that healthcare system, and they don't have a choice. We're sacrificing them. Oh, I'm wondering then if the arguments that people usually give against guaranteed minimum income is, oh, then people just won't work, or they won't work as soon as it gets you know difficult. So if these people who have liquor store jobs and whatever had a guaranteed minimum income, then simply we would have nobody in liquor stores because they would all say, I would rather get my $1,000 a month or whatever the thing is, $2,000 a month, than the $200 additional or maybe less, you know, whatever they're getting paid. In the absence of the risk of death, that argument doesn't hold up. And most of the evidence doesn't suggest that a guaranteed minimum income would encourage people not to work. But if the difference is between guaranteed minimum income and guaranteed minimum income times 1.25 and risk of death, I'll take guaranteed minimum income. So is that an argument then <laughs> that it's so good that we don't have a guaranteed minimum income because we need those people out there working and risking themselves unfairly? No, it's not an argument in favor of that. It's, it goes to 
kind of how I started the conversation of like, what are the privations? What are the things that people sacrifice or willing to sacrifice for others? And if in the case of consumption, like, hey, consume less, buy less, or stay home more because people's lives are at risk versus, hey, you got to go work the drive through window at Starbucks because even during a pandemic, people want their drive through coffee. Like those are different sorts of things, but those are the choices people are having to make right now. And it strikes me as fundamentally unfair that that's the situation. I don't know how to solve it, but basically somebody said somewhere, this is an essential service and this is not. Then the corporations or the companies or whatever that are considered essential have to make a decision. We're going to stay in business or we're going to stay open or not. And then they pass that decision on to their employees. Some of them, they say, you can choose to come in or not. If you don't, we'll furlough you and you can apply for unemployment. Or, you know, say, quit, come in and work or quit. You're in a, it's an essential service. There's all of these different places in the chain where it can break down and it puts an unfair burden on the individuals to make choices that they don't have enough information and they can't. It, it just strikes me as it's not equitable. One of the things that had occurred to me was how aware this makes us of our interdependency. I had this experience early on because I was having quite a bit of stress and anxiety, which I deal with mainly, you know, in the beginning when this all this all of this started, I just overconsumed news and social media basically and just to expose myself to as much information about it as possible for much of the day. You know, and I had some things that, you know, I've had some things that I've had to worry about. So for instance, being a live-in director of a transitional home, a group home with 16 people in it total and knowing that this is a particularly vulnerable situation and what the hell am I going to do if one person in here gets infected and how am I going to prevent that from happening? I had to worry about that sort of stuff. But also, I just, I was kind of startled by, you know, it's the sort of thing we talked about on the Judith Butler episode, but becoming aware of inter- interdependency in ways that I just not, you know, you know it abstractly, but you're not necessarily viscerally acquainted with it. Like just the feeling like, yeah, oh yeah. This, so if no one manufactures toilet paper, then I will never have toilet paper again because I will, I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do any of these things. And if it stops happening, then that's no longer a part of my life. So what we encounter in that, I think is it's not just anxiety You know, I wasn't all that worried about getting the virus myself, although a little bit, in the sense I wouldn't want to go through an even quote unquote mild case from what I've heard and how terrible it is. But I think we're acquainted more or we're confronted not just with our own personal mortality, but with how fragile society is and how it could all just sort of fall apart and (laughs) go back to a state of nature, which people are fighting each other to the death for rolls of toilet paper or whatever. That caused me some anxiety, I think. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of speculating here because I wasn't able to say exactly why, but it was a new experience for me. Do you guys get what I'm saying? I do. And ultimately, the point of my initial question that kicked this whole thing off was to point out that the ask to change your behavior in response to another is it's highlighted here in the pandemic, but it's something that happens frequently and can happen in many different contexts. And I think if we talk about Camus the Plague or something like that, that you're going to see the same thing, that it's talking about the human response to existential threats or threats at all to the community or some parts of the community. And it points to the connectedness of like how the way we respond and what we do isn't just our own individual response, but it also has impact on others. I listened to a Freakonomics podcast this past weekend talking about the food supply chain and what all of this change in behaviors is doing to the food supply chain and how it's affecting all this stuff. And one of the things they pointed out, Adam Smith's favorite example, right? There's no one person alive right now who could make a pencil. Like all the technologies and everything. So, if you think just using a pencil means that you are requiring the knowledge, the expertise, and the resources of people around the world, imagine how much more so it is for your food. Imagine how much more so it is for your medicine, for you know the roads that you drive on, for the car that you drive, for the internet that you use. I mean, it, and so what we realize here is that this dependency is not just economic. The lesson of this is that the dependency is not just economic, but our very health, 
our very existence has a dependency on the way other people behave, the way that they manage their health, the way that they choose to make decisions about whether to you know, wash their hands or not. And it's like, that's just terrifying. <laughs> but that's the lesson I get out of all of this. Well, which puts in a different perspective that we're normally as, as individualistic. Uh, you know, you're free to think whatever you want. But you're not free to wash your ha- not wash your hands after you take a pee. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. That seems to be a fairly like intimate thing <laughs> of of basically regarding. No, I do want you to think the way that health professionals recommend in this because it has a direct effect on me in a way that perhaps it doesn't normally. Well, we'll see. We'll see how far the understanding of this of you know Wes's. Would you call it communitarian? I don't know what the the point of view is, how far it pushes back on traditional American libertarianism. I I suspect it might initially somewhat, and then I imagine we'll get a pretty violent rebound. I think it's similar to other kinds of – look at public drunkenness and drunk driving. When I was younger, it was just – I'll call it frowned upon to drive drunk, right? (laughs) But it's more frowned upon to get caught, (laughs) <laughs> or to actually hit somebody when you were driving drunk. That's like, oh, that was pretty dumb, right? But now it's significantly different than it was for my kids and around that, you know, getting into a car while you're drunk, it's not that it doesn't happen. It doesn't happen too much. It's just that it's much, much, much less socially acceptable. So the idea that you have a responsibility to regulate yourself for the sake of other people's. And, and importantly, that thinking is not about you surviving. We don't want you to die in a drunken car accident, right? It's that we don't want you to kill other people. That's why you shouldn't go drink and drive. We can care less about what you do yourself. The force of that is mostly what you're going to do to other people. I think similar kind of thing here. I, I expect in my work that there will be a decided impact on people at least working from home, if not just calling in sick when they have some kind of illness putting aside COVID-19, just about their general communicability and their effect they have on other people and realizing that, you know what? The fact that I got sick the other day was because Joe next to me at the meeting sneezed all the shit over me. And he and I ought to be, if we have a cold, we sneeze into our elbows. And if I'm really feeling sick, I should stay home. I think there's going to be a long tail on that at the very least, if not a decided change in the way people behave and their responsibility they feel for inf- inflicting their their illnesses on other people. For those people who have the luxury of being able to stay home, whether it's to work remote or to not, sure. yes. But I, you know yeah, what? I get it, but they can still sneeze into their arms, right? <laughs> well, you know, I, I, I don't disagree with that. I'm just saying the point was that nothing's going to change about it. I'm saying that I think actually the way people will behave with each other is going to change in a similar way that we've seen with other kinds of expectations socially for people, for other examples. Perhaps. I think there will be an equally violent, like, alt-reaction to it, too, that this is just going to stir up more of the craziness that has existed and that has become much more visible in the last four years internationally. And I hope that it's drowned out by the communal goodwill. If the enemy of communitarianism is libertarianism, there's always the dynamic that some libertarians will say, it's not that we're against people changing norms. It's just we want them to be not enforced by the government. And that's the whole thing. But then when it comes down to it, they don't want there to be group thing. The essential part is not whether government is mandating it or not. Because as in the case with drunk driving that you were just mentioning, Dylan, the change in norms has gone hand in hand with the penalties, the legal penalties getting much, much more fierce. So those two things pretty much always interact with each other, just inevitably. You're not going to get, maybe people could think of counterexamples, but it seems like that if we have a strong social thing in, in favor of social distancing, that would be strengthened by a law on the books about that. Or do you think, Wes, you seem to be thinking that, you know, if, if we're authoritarian about it, in other words, people are, for the most part, happy to make these sacrifices and do these things, but if it's imposed on them, then that'll increase resistance. Yeah. Well, that's actually what I got from poking around on the internet about the Spanish flu, is that you get a much better response by soliciting cooperation and explaining why you need it than from being a hard ass about it. 
So I don't know if that's, you know, I can't say whether that's definitively true. It, it seems plausible to me. I'm sure that at some point, if the public doesn't cooperate, you have to be hard ass. But I think, you know, what I gathered from the way things worked out in the Spanish flu is that, again, there's a limit to public patience. And after a certain point, there's not anything you can do about that. So you get a lot of cooperation in the beginning, but people are not going to be jobless at home forever. I like the idea of laws on the books that are not enforced very much. <laughs> in other words, you have something that is an official deterrent because we're playing a numbers game with this whole thing, right? If people are only doing essential travel, but we never check, you can just ask somebody, is, is what you're doing essential? And they say yes, and you let them on their way. Like that still has the overall effect of lowering the communication rate. Like just having something that being a hard ass, you know, you could just have fines. Like that's what we have generally. It's not like there are people with guns standing outside your house in the way that there were in, I don't know, some, some of these accounts of past plagues of like. Oh, well, just in China. <laughs> yeah, in China right now. Yeah, standing outside your house with a gun. Like, if the point is to keep people safe, then threatening them with physical violence <laughs> seems a little counterproductive. So I know last time we announced that our next topic was going to be Shakespeare's King Lear. That has been recorded. This was inserted in front of it to keep it current. The topic we're supposed to talk about today will be next. That's Aristotle's Poetics. And then we're going to have what will essentially be the second half of this discussion, but probably a normal full-length episode on Camus' The Plague. We can build on what we've said here to talk about that more extreme circumstance and the interesting things Camus has to say about that. We want to know what you think, whether there were significant philosophical issues that we left on the table. I was hoping this would not dissolve into you know merely arguing about policy, and I, I'm not sure. <laughs> we'll see what people think about this. Yeah, I'm not either, I would, <laughs> but it is what it is. Yep. So partiallyexaminedlife.com, you can get this with the extended nude parts at uh, by supporting us in the, the member feed. There's no extended nude part. There's no <laughs> advantage this this week of being a, a citizen, but you might well want to go to partiallyexaminedlife.com slash support if you want to support what we're doing here. Or maybe you would ethically think that you should be using that money to uh, order from your favorite restaurant, that that would be better to keep those things afloat. I don't know. Uh, keep us afloat. We're one of the people. Yeah. We're one of the businesses that needs to be kept afloat. <laughs> or support your favorite musical artists whose touring income has gone away. Our closing song today is Date of Grace by one such artist, Rod Peacott. I spoke to him on Nakedly Examined Music episode 80 about this very song. You can find that at nakedlyexaminedmusic.com. Uh, good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Lifted me like I was weightless Then you let me fall back down again It's alright, we fly the best we can And I know your wings were broken I dusted off my blue shirt And poured some whiskey where it hurt Picked the pieces out of the dirt Kept them as a token There ain't nothing left to do When your date of grace is due Remember all the nights we laid Across your sheets of serenade from the sky, the stars all played back then. They all for you. Back then, I was just a kid trying to walk like I thought grown men did. Too thin to hide what I needed hit, so I kept my heart from you. There ain't nothing left to say It don't matter now anyway There ain't nothing left to do Your date of grace is due All the 
this time us to think about you and the love that could not pull us through. From tying stones to the devil's shoes, just trying to slow his dance down. Burned your letters on the lawn while I was working on a song. The tune was good, but the words were wrong. And I never found the right ones. There ain't nothing left to say. It don't matter now anyway. There ain't nothing left to do when your date of grace is due. When your date of grace is due. From truth, he dusted my heart looking for proof. All you found was the wisdom tooth I lost along the way.